Hello everybody and welcome to episode 13 of the Inkle Gamers Podcast. Today we have a fun episode. We're going to be talking about 10 cards from Rise of the Floodborne. We each brought 5 that we wanted to talk about. Now the cards aren't necessarily good or bad. We just thought they were interesting and we're going to give our opinions on them. And at the end of this episode we're going to be talking a little bit about the canon of the set as well. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a lot of fun. So let's get right into it. Dana, what is the very first card that you want to talk about? So my first card is Queen of Hearts, Quick Tempered. This is a card that I don't think is good, but I definitely wanted to talk about because I feel like it's very interesting and noteworthy for it being an emerald. So she's an uninkable two drop, a one two, quests for two, and then has the ability Royal Rage. When you play this character, deal one damage to chosen damaged opposing character. I think her ability is too niche to probably see a lot of gameplay. You have to already have a damaged opposing character on the board. And when she enters, it's she's only dealing one damage to one character. It's not like it's to all damaged characters or anything that would make it really impressive to me. But I did want to talk about it because I feel like it's the first time we are seeing this type of effect in the color of Emerald. I feel like up until now, Steel had the type of cards that were when a character enters the battlefield, they deal X amount of damage to characters, whether it's one or multiple. And we didn't really have that in an Emerald up until this point. And so I hope that we'll see more of that type of effect in Emerald with other cards because I just think this one isn't good enough. But I I hope that it's kind of the start of maybe the effects that we saw in Chapter 1 starting to be shown in other colors too and not just exclusive to the color that we know thus far. Yeah, I think this is how they're going to do damage in emerald we we do have stampede as a card which deals two damage to a damaged character yeah right so i think that's the route they're going to take the character has to already be damaged i don't really like this card for what it's worth there are a few different things i think they could have done to make this card pretty good for one they could have just made it inkable Mm -hmm. for two they could have made that deal one damage to any character instead of just a damaged a, one a damaged character yeah but that might make it too oppressive against the like lilo making a wish and maleficent buying her time kind of decks in the new pinocchio i don't think they really wanted that so yeah i just don't think it's going to get there for me if you are going first you're never going to be able to use this ability because they won't ever have an ex- a exerted character or a character with damage on it on turn two. So it just doesn't hit the mark. Yeah, it kind of makes me sad because Alice in Wonderland is one of my two favorite Disney movies. So I really wanted them to do the Queen of Hearts justice and they let me down. <laughs> yeah, they, they did not get there on this one. That's okay though. Not every, not every card has to be a hit. Yeah. All right. So what is your first card? My first card is Mulan Reflecting. It is a Floodborne. It is a four cost, three, three inkable character that quests for two. It also shifts for two. And it has the ability Honor to the Ancestors. Whenever this character quests, you may reveal the top card of your deck. If it's a song card, you may play for free. Otherwise, put it on top of your deck. So, I wanted to talk about this card because... I think as a shift character that is a 3-3 and quest for 2, I think that stat line might be good if we have any number of cheap Mulans that this can shift onto. Mm -hmm. As far as the ability goes, I do not think that ability is very good at all. Really? I I was the opposite. (laughs) So here, I did the math. I did the math, Dana. Yeah, you're the math guy. I'm the math guy. If you quest with this card on turn five, you have to have 25 songs in your deck to have over a 51% chance for that ability to work. And not only that, but you actually have to have good songs in your deck for the impact to mean anything. For example, if you play a Kuna Matata in your deck and you flip over a Kuna Matata, it might not even do anything on that turn. So you don't really want situational songs. You just want songs that are powerful, like Friends on the Other Side or maybe Grab Your Swords. But you need 
a lot of those to hit at a 50% clip. And I just don't know that you can have 30 songs in your deck in order to make this consistent enough. Yeah, I was thinking about it from this perspective. So we already know that Steel Amber song deck is strong because that's currently what the meta is and it's proven to be a really strong deck archetype. I felt like seeing this card, it would fit right into that type of deck pretty easily. And if a Steel Amber song deck is already popular, there's a reason why I don't know how to I don't know how to describe it. What you're seeing, I think, is that the card that revolves around songs should go into the current song deck as we know it. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I felt like it would fit really well into one of the most popular decks of the meta right now. Yeah, I thought about that. I just don't know if it necessarily has a place because it can't sing Grab Your Swords or A Whole New World and... It's just not as consistent as actually drawing a card as Ariel uh, might be, so... Well, it's not... It doesn't say that you can't play it. You can just play it for free. Like, you, it's not like they can't sing it because she's not strong enough. You, it doesn't matter what it is. You just sing it. No, I'm thinking if you just have the card in your hand. Oh. Yeah, like, if you reveal all the top, yeah, you get to play for free. But if you just have the card in your hand, this doesn't sing that card, so... I just don't think it's going to be consistent enough. Hmm. Okay. So, okay. We can argue. <laughs> <laughs> I'll fight you to the death on this. No, I think, no, it's it's a definitely an interesting card. I'd be interested to see if people will play it and if they do, how long it would last. Because I can see the Steel Amber players already just thinking that, oh, that's a great addition, so they'll put it in, but I'm curious if it'll it'll last. Yeah, I think for all intents and purposes, this card is probably just worse than the Emerald Hans that cost four and quest for three. Unless, of course, we do have a Mulan that costs one that we can shift this onto that might change my opinion a little bit. We don't know that, but I just don't think it's powerful enough as it is. Okay, so going on to my second card, I wanted to talk about Rapunzel Gifted Artist. So... An amber inkable five drop. I like this one. Yep. <laughs> uh, zero six quests for two shift three, and then her ability is let your power shine. Whenever you remove one or more damage from one of your characters, you may draw a card. This is a perfect complement to Rapunzel gifted with healing. I think that is going to be really essential for people to play in their Amber decks where they're already playing that Rapunzel because you're getting that damage removal. You get to draw a card with Rapunzel gifted with healing. And then you also get to draw a card with this too. So you're getting almost like a double draw. I really liked this one. Yeah, I like this one too. Uh, a quest for two. I think the, the main issue with it is... It doesn't survive the Maui test, Dana. Mm. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, the main issue with it is that whenever you do quest with it, you're just, it's probably just going to get attacked back and get banished. And it doesn't have any strength, so it's just not very good defensively. But the fact that it can heal for each character from one card that might heal all the characters, I think that's really powerful. Hakuna Matata with this is really strong if you have three damaged characters. You're going to draw three cards with it. I like that. And especially with all the healing cards that are going in. Sapphire with Dingle Hopper and Amber already. This one looks like it could be a real powerhouse draw engine. Mm -hmm, for sure. Okay, what's your second card? My second card is Pinocchio Star Attraction. This one is a two cost uninkable 1-1 one -one that quests for three. It is a two cost card that quests for three. That is something that we have not seen before, but I do not think this card is very good. Mm -hmm. I think that the comparison that I like to make with this card is to burn decks in Magic the Gathering. If you don't know what that means, that's okay. Just follow along with me here. So a burn deck is essentially a deck that's using all of its resources to deal damage to the face. So magic, you start at 20 life and you try to get your opponent down to zero, kind of the inverse of this game. And you have a lot of cards that deal three and four damage in order to do that. So this card is trying to get you up to 20 lore really fast, but the chances are is that you're 
only going to be able to quest with it once before it gets banished. Mm -hmm. And I don't think three lore for one two cost card is generally going to be strong enough because you'll quest, it'll get banished, and then you're down on board still. It's the same reason why I don't like Flynn Rider that much is because Flynn just gets banished almost instantly. And now you do get the card back with Flynn. You don't get the card back with Pinocchio. Flynn is also inkable, which makes it a little more flexible. Pinocchio is not inkable. I just don't think it's going to be consistent enough, nor do I think you have a, a critical mass enough of this type of effect, especially in Amethyst, in order to get you to 20 before you run out of resources. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree in that I didn't think this card was good either. And as a current Emerald Amethyst player, I don't plan on putting this in my deck, but I get where your argument is coming from. I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Yeah, of course. So it's pretty much you're going to quest for it one time and it's probably going to get banished. If you think about it like this, you have other cards that are one and two drops in this color that only quest for one. And it's the same concept with them. You pretty much will probably only get one quest out of them and then they're going to get banished. At least if you're going to have a one and done... At least having them quest for three is kind of worth making it worth your while to where even if it is a one and done, it's better than if it were to be like an Archimedes or an Olaf. So you're at least getting a little bit more bang for your buck than if you were to have like an Olaf or Archimedes. Yes, it's I know that the stats are different, 2-2 two, two and 1-3 or whatever, but generally most of those characters would get banished right away. So... I don't know. Kind of looking at it from that, I, again, still think it's bad. I'm not going to personally add this to my deck, but I can kind of see how you can weigh the pros and cons and how it, it might be worth some people putting in there because they might have that logic too. You know, if it's going to get banished in one time anyway, I might as well do one that will have a questing of three. Yeah, and I get that. And I think if we get like a similar card to Pinocchio in either Emerald or Amber, that's a two cost that quest for three then we might really be talking because amber has lilo which quest for two has a one cost and then emerald has a lot of characters with a high lore count as well so i can see that but i think you just need more of these in order to fit into the game plan of your deck mm -hmm. um i just don't think having one of these is enough to get you there the difference with other two cost cards is that they, or even the one cost cards, is that they usually trade with the card that's trying to challenge them, right? Mm -hmm. Archimedes can do that. Olaf can do that a little bit. Like if he doesn't trade, he'll at least survive. Yeah, he doesn't trade, he'll survive. And then you can use that body to make other trades. Pascal, he just quests for the first five turns of the game. and Yeah, his evasiveness <laughs> definitely helps him. Yeah. So, yeah, that's kind of where I am on it. I probably won't play it unless we get a few more cards that are very similar to it. Mm -hmm, for sure. It could definitely be super powerful if they print this card in another color, though. Right. For sure. Okay. So, my third card is Bell Hidden Archer. I am super excited to talk about this one as an Emerald player because I know for a fact this is going to be an automatic add to my deck once this set comes out. So Belle hit an archer. She's an uninkable five drop, shifts for three, a three three, quests for three, and then has the ability thorny arrows. Whenever this character is challenged, the challenging character's player discards all cards in their hand. I think this goes hand in hand right with the other emerald cards where you have high questing characters that have a de-incentivization for challenging them. So I think she's going to fit really well right in with the Cusco, the Cheshire, the Mad Hatter, all of those that make your opponent think twice before challenging you. Except this one is it's pretty nasty. Having your opponent discard all of the cards in their hand is probably, I think, making her less likely to get challenged than Cusco or maybe just the same. Like, I think her and Cusco, if we're talking about all of those that I just named off, if I'm playing someone who plays either one of those cards, it's one of those like, oh, oh no. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh God. 
And so, yeah, I think she's right up in there with Cusco as far as really something that your opponents aren't going to want to see. Yeah, definitely. I think this could just replace the Mad Hatter completely. There is a really strong curve of Bell into John Silver that if you just quest with Bell on turn six, play John Silver, give one of their characters Reckless, and they have to attack into Bell, that can be really devastating for them. Mm -hmm. Discarding your whole hand is no joke because that just means that they have to top deck. Yeah, they have the top deck for the rest of the game. And we already have seen cards like You Have Forgotten Me. That just discards two cards, but that still can be extremely powerful in a lot of scenarios. Yeah. I think this one, I know a lot of people are just saying, oh, we're just going to get smashed or something, but it, it's never that easy. Your Mad Hatters don't always get dragon fired right. Right. You still just play them and uh, usually you'll get a quest out of them. The difference between this and Mad Hatter is that them discarding their whole hand is worth a lot more than you just drawing a card. Right. Now, if they already don't have a hand because they already attacked into this earlier, then, well, I, it probably doesn't matter. You're probably already winning the game, but then you don't get any real value out of it. That being said, this is going to be one of the scariest cards to see when your opponent plays it on turn five. Yeah. It makes me really glad to be an Emerald player. <laughs> yeah, this this is one that I am not looking forward to playing <laughs> with you. <laughs> I'm going to be real annoying. Yeah, I'm going to have to figure something out so I don't have to challenge that thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so moving on. What is your third card? My third card is Goofy Night for a Day. It is a thick boy. Big boy. Big boy. It is a... Nine cost inkable, 10 10 character that quests for four. Quest for four. So, this to me is just not a very strong card. It looks to me like a worse Mickey Mouse Brave Little Tailor, and that card doesn't see a whole lot of play. Maybe like a one or two of in some of the Ruby Control decks. This one cost nine as opposed to Mickey costing eight. I mean, this has a lot of stats on it, but there comes a point where just having a lot of stats is kind of useless. I mean, what's the difference between this character having being like a 10-10 or a 20-20? Mm -hmm. there, there really is no difference because your opponents aren't going to want to challenge into this anyway, and it's going to banish everything that it sees either way. It's not like magic where you're attacking your opponent's face or Hearthstone or any of these other games where the size of the character matters in how you are winning the game. So I, if this was an 8-8 or higher, it's just kind of the same, same card to me. Mm -hmm. It can quest for four. That is a lot. It's probably better than the Maui that we have in this color that quests for three. With that being said, I don't know if this, <laughs> if this is really a very playable card. So I kind of differ with you on that. And I think it's only because you and I play different colored decks. This doesn't seem scary to you because you play Ruby which has the dragon that banishes and dragon fire that banishes. Whereas for me, I currently am doing Emerald Amethyst and we don't have any direct removals like that or even like let it go or anything like that. So the only way that I can get rid of this card when I see it is to trade multiple characters into it. So I don't particularly <laughs> think this card is as bad as you do just because of the color combo that I'm playing. I know I don't have options and i i know i'm not locked into those these colors i know i could go to ruby if i wanted to but i don't want to <laughs> no i get you um i don't think personally that with your deck you'll ever trade into this unless you absolutely have to because you have cheshire you have kuzco which if this thing ever challenges which it should be challenging you because you'd be the more aggressive deck this cost nine ink the, the Goofy will get banished as well. Then you also have Genie to bounce it, which is a huge tempo swing. And if we uh, if we get you on the Mother Knows Best train... Never. Never. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this Mother Knows Best also deals with this pretty effectively as well, as well as... Elsa too. Mm -hmm. So I just, I just don't see it. It's too expensive. It doesn't do anything when it comes into play. It just seems like a really slow finisher, but I 
think there are enough really slow finishers that this one's probably just not needed for how expensive it is. Mm -hmm. And actually, I kind of misspoke because I realized that I forgot about a card that was literally revealed right before we started recording this episode. So Ring the Bell was just leaked, and it is an inkable three-drop action that banishes chosen damaged character. So I misspoke when I said that we didn't have any direct removal, although this does have to be a damaged character. So I guess if you're playing, like if you still have an Olaf on board, you could just sacrifice it just to put one damage on the Goofy and then play this one. But I, again, I feel like that's super niche. So I'm still going to go back to standing strong that I don't have a lot of good removals at this point. But I just wanted to clarify that I forgot there technically now is a removal action for emerald it's just not very good (laughs) yeah this one it's at least thinkable though so when it's not good you can ink it and it always has that uh base level to make it playable i think yeah for sure um yeah this this could be a a good answer to it and probably another reason why i don't like goofy (laughs) (laughs) thank you (laughs) (laughs) problem All right, Dana, what is your next card? So my fourth card is Grand Pabby, the oldest and wisest, a uninkable seven cost, three six, quests for three, and has ancient knowledge. Whenever you remove one or more damage from one of your characters, you may gain two lore. I think the ability of this card to gain lore when healing is possibly going to lead to maybe an emergence of us seeing a Sapphire Amber combo which isn't a combo that is currently seen very often, but I feel like if there are going to be more cards that will be similar to this in Sapphire, and we already know that Amber does have the characteristic of being kind of the healing color. I don't know. I think I just wanted to point this out because I think if I'm looking at this card and I want to play it, my instinct is to make an Amber deck with it. So yeah, I think we might see it being paired with an Amber deck. Yeah, this card seems really powerful i don't know how consistent it'll be but i can just imagine you having two of these in play like a dingle hopper in play uh like your dingle hopper removes a counter from a random character of yours you gain a bunch of lore then you sing hakuna matata you gain 12 lore i don't Mm -hmm. know yeah this seems like a really dangerous combo card and Really interested to try it out. Plus, if I could play Dingle Hopper with uh, Maurice and have these grand pappies and stuff, you know, this this can lead to an item deck as well. And You're, I'm all about that. <laughs> finally, you can get your item deck. No, I don't. I don't think uh, those two archetypes will overlap very much. But I will it's, make it's it try. Of... <laughs> I will make it. I'll try to make it happen. You're never gonna let that go. No. Yeah. No. Um. Yeah. So I I think it's really good. I think we're. I think this will definitely see play for sure. Yeah, I'm glad it is uninkable because it definitely is going to have those explosive turns in the late games where you just kind of went out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And I like that they didn't make it super flexible in that you can just ink it early when it's, you know, a dead card. But yeah, this one seems really powerful. Yeah, for sure. Okay, what is your fourth card? My fourth card is also a Sapphire card. It is Gaston Intellectual Powerhouse. It is an uninkable 6 cost, 4-4, four, four, that quests for 3. It shifts for 4, and it has developed brain. When you play this character, look at the top 3 cards of your deck. You may put one into your hand and the rest on the bottom of your deck in any order. I think this card is, like, busted. Honestly, I think this is probably going to be one of the better cards in the set. I know there's only so much room in your deck for uninkable expensive characters, but this one can shift for four, so that takes the cost of it down significantly. Mm -hmm. And it's not just draw a card when you play it. It is look at the top three, so you get a decent amount of selection as well. I think this is going to replace Robin Hood in a lot of decks, because Robin Hood always costs six, and you don't always get the the draw from Robin Hood, whereas you always get the draw from this one. It quests for more than Robin Hood. It has the same body. Yes, Robin Hood has that one evasive clause on your turn, but I don't think that is near enough to overcome the power that Gaston can 
can bring to your sapphire decks especially if we have other cheap gastons i know we have the ruby one mm -hmm. which could probably play well in this deck anyway i'm just really excited this card looks really strong to me yeah for sure and like you said too <clears throat> it's not like you're looking at the card selecting and then putting the one that you want face down on top of your deck like you get to just automatically put it in your hand so like you said you are getting that extra draw and yeah i think it's i think it's really good too yeah, the difference between just drawing a random card and looking at the top three and picking the best one is pretty significant when you're trying to find your Be Prepareds on time, uh, when you're trying to find your Hades or Maleficent or whatever it is. Maybe you're just trying to find Grand Pappy because it's part of your combo deck, right? Just finding, going three cards deep to find the best one to help you find the piece that you're missing is really powerful. And... Being able to do that on a reasonable sized body on turn four seems excellent to me. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Dana, what is your fifth card? Tell us about it. Yeah, so my fifth and final card is Cogsworth Talking Clock. He is an inkable two drop, a two, three, quests for one, and then has, wait a minute, your character with Reckless gains exert, gain one lore. So I find this card really interesting because one of the downfalls of Reckless is that you are forced to challenge if able, but with Cogsworth giving them the ability that they could also exert to gain one lore, thus questing instead, is really good because you give them that either or option that other characters have if they were to have not had Reckless. Yeah, so most characters with Reckless have really good stats for their cost, like Maui and Gaston, for example. And they don't do a whole lot when your opponent doesn't have any characters in play. They really do nothing. Mm -hmm. So this gives those cards some extra utility in the late game when you draw them later and your opponent doesn't have anything for them to challenge into. So I think this card is also really strong. This goes really well into a Ruby Sapphire deck with the Gaston that I was talking about because then you get access to the Ruby Gaston to shift into. I really like this two drop. It seems pretty flexible and powerful to me. Yeah. All right. So what is your fifth and final card? My fifth and final card is Basil, Great Mouse Detective. It is a six cost inkable character that is a three four. It shifts for five and it quests for three and it has the ability there's always a chance. If you use shift to play this character, you may draw two cards when he enters play. That is a pretty strong line of text. Now, the real question is, are the other two basils that have been released good enough to make you want to play this to to shift it mm -hmm. i think the two cost basil the one that has support and is a two two is pretty good i think shifting onto that one is pretty powerful the four cost basil he is i i don't want to play that one a whole lot because when you shift onto that you're gaining no stats mm -hmm. normally when you shift it's a pretty big swing and tempo because you have a bigger character that can challenge your opposing characters mm -hmm. but you're not gaining any of those stats from the four cost basil that being said the four cost basil could just be a pretty reasonable card by itself because it quests for two and has a three four for four and it's inkable so we've already seen cards like that see some play so if you're playing those two this is kind of a slam dunk drawing two cards is really powerful again this could be just another card that takes up robin hood's spot that being said robin hood is better by itself you don't have to commit as many deck slots to it but if you find use in the other two basils this card seems really powerful yeah at first i was kind of on the fence about this one because the shifting only goes down by one whereas a lot of the shifting you're at least going down by two costs but i think his ability makes up for it but like you said it would have to be in the condition that you're playing the other two as well but i think that was my only issue with that yeah, it's not a very good standalone card. You 
have to want to play the other two basils in your deck it's possible that robin hood might just be a little more consistent because you can play three of those and nothing else and it's perfectly fine whereas this you have to most likely play seven to eight smaller basils to really get the max benefit out of this you can never just play this on turn six by itself and really feel good about it yeah with that being said, though, I am super stoked we're seeing the Great Mouse Detective in set two because if you had listened to our like introduction episode, I talked about how I think the Great Mouse Detective is the most underrated Disney movie of all time. It's and a pretty good one. It is so good. It's it. I I probably should say that it's one of my favorites, but I know this whole time I've been saying Alice and Hercules are, but this is probably like my third favorite, if I'm being honest. It's mm -hmm. just so underrated, but I'm really excited that we're seeing a lot of cards from this movie for sure. Yeah, Floodborne Basil is awesome. Yeah, <laughs> super cool. <laughs> it is super awesome. And while we're talking about Basil and all of the cards involving him, I think that's a great segue into the second half of our episode, which is talking about the canon of the story for this game. I'll probably come back to Basil because I want to start off with what we currently know from chapter one before we get into Rise of the Floodborne. But I figured that I can kind of go through because I know that between the two of us, I have been paying a little bit more attention to the artwork and picking out small little details. And so if it's okay with you, I kind of want to take the reins and just go off of, just regurgitate everything that I have picked up so far. Now I'm here to support you. Okay. <laughs> so if you are new into Lorcana and you don't really necessarily know the background behind the story so far, I'm just going to go through it really quick. So Floodborn, Storyborn, Dreamborn are all of these keywords that you see on cards. So the Storyborn is characters as we know them from their stories. Dreamborn is a more elevated version of that character. And then Floodborn is a version of that character after what I guess us fans, because I don't think they've necessarily gave it a name yet, but we're calling it the Great Flood. And so that signifies some cataclysmic event that has happened, triggered by characters that we're starting to suspect, which I'll get into, but it created these like multiverse versions of the characters. And so I basically have two categories of cards that I'm going to be talking about. One, their artwork for sure gives some sort of idea to what events might have occurred. And then there are quite a few cards that have something just off about their artwork and I don't know how it would fit in quite yet but I do just want to point those out. So I'll probably spend more time on the first category and then I'll probably just rapid fire all of the weird things I see for the second category. Going with the first one. So in chapter one we see some clues pointing towards Ursula possibly being behind the Great Flood because you have the Duke of Wesselton and then Mickey Mouse Detective who are both examining what appears to be like seaweed and it's kind of at the scene of the crime because there's just ink everywhere. And then we also see Flotsam stealing the metal trinket that is out of Ariel's cavern that we see in her Who's It Collector artwork too. Going further into set two, Donald and Minnie are both divers and we see that in Donald's artwork. And based on his flavor text, we can kind of get an idea for how they might have gotten kind of separated. I think they were just kind of breaking up. I think Donald says, hey, you go over there to look for that. I'll, I'll look for this over here. And then in Minnie's artwork for the diver, we see her approaching what appears to be Ursula's lair. And then there's also like some seaweed in the top right corner of that background too. And so I feel like there are tons of artwork amongst the cards that are just pinpointing Ursula as being probably the main contributor behind it. I do have another guess for maybe another character that's involved, which I will just get right into. So Hades, King of Olympus is my second suspect, maybe an accomplice, because I feel like Ursula is shown as being probably the main contributor behind it. But we all know that Hades main goal in his story is to take over Olympus and be the king of it, essentially. And so this card being a floodborn is 
the result of the great flood. And he's seen on his throne holding this golden trinket that appears to kind of be from the great illuminary. And so I almost wonder if whatever that was helped contribute to him achieving that. And so maybe he was one of the people that also caused it so he can get what he wants. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And while we're on the subject of the trinket that's in his hand, let me get into some of the other items that we see pretty prevalent in cards. So in Bell, Inventive Engineer, and Maurice, World Famous Inventor, they're both examining some sort of golden item. For Bell, it's like this scepter that almost appears to be what kind of goes in with what Maurice is holding, which is like this orb. And we see that orb appear several times. It seems to be the same orb that's in Ariel Who's It Collector and the one that Flotsam is presumably stealing. And so I think that whatever those items are, are going to be what they're either using to like reverse the Great Flood or do something with. I don't know. I feel like they're just obviously important items because everybody's talking about that, right? Um, And then... Tying into Basil, Basil seems to be doing a lot in the Great Illuminary or with golden trinket items. And I think he's just playing right into maybe both working with like Bell Engineer and Maurice, but then also going out and trying to solve it with Duke of Wesselton and Mickey Mouse Detective. So in two of his cards, he looks like he's in the Great Illuminary, and then he's kind of out and about as the Great Mouse Detective flying on his little contraption, thopter, or whatever that is, I don't know, (laughs) right? Okay, so some other things that I had picked out. This required some serious zoom-in. And that was for Cut to the Chase. In the card from the first chapter, Cut to the Chase, we see Mickey BLT approaching a castle or maybe it's the Great Illuminary. And then there's a shadowy figure that's looking out of the watchtower. And I would bet money, it kind of looks like the silhouette of Pete. So I kind of wonder if Pete is also involved as well. I feel like in my head, I almost wonder that once the Great Flood happens... Which is, I don't know, it's kind of hard because we do see them in, we do see several characters in the Great Illuminary, but I feel like there is at one point it gets overtaken by the characters that caused the Floodborne and the good characters have to find a way back in. Because for Artful Rogue, it almost looks like he's, he's like stealthy and kind of roping in to what looks like Again, the Great Illuminary, just because of the window and the background and everything, too. So it's almost like he's sneaking in to a place that he once belonged. So I almost wonder at some point if it was cut off. Which also kind of reminds me of the artwork that we're seeing in the new Daisy Duck. Because she appears to be sneaking around, too. And has this rope over her shoulder, kind of like what Mickey Artful Rogue is using. And so I feel like maybe at one point they're both sneaking back into the Great Illuminary at the same time of the overtaking is what I'm assuming. I don't know. That's just me spitballing, right? Um, But yeah, those were like the main ones that I felt like I could kind of tell a story with the artwork. But now I'm just going to go down the list for the rest of the cards that I just felt like had something in their artwork that seemed off. I don't know how it fits in the story, but I feel like it's just noteworthy. Yeah. (laughs) Are you ready? Yeah, let's do this. I'm just going to rapid fire down. So Cinderella, gentle and kind, she's obviously holding some sort of golden, glowy, floating orb, kind of similar to what looks like a luminary magic. And then the Magic Broom Bucket Brigade and Mickey Mouse Wayward Sorcerer. So normally in the regular story of the Sorcerer's Apprentice, the Bucket Brigade, they're carrying buckets of water. But in the artwork, they're carrying what looks like purple magic which is the same magic that mickey wayward sorcerer has in his scepter so i almost wonder if they're getting ready to go off to battle and they're kind of fueling the magic that mickey's using to fight i don't know that's just i just thought that you could see if you look closely you could see what's in their buckets and i thought that was interesting mother knows best there is in the reflection of the mirror there are claw-like hand shadows And I'm not going to lie, I know it's impossible because this is obviously inside and what I'm about to say occurs outside, but those claw-like hand shadows kind of 
looks similar to that scene in Snow White when she gets lost in the woods and the trees are kind of grabbing at her dress and everything. I just felt like that was interesting. But And then there's also spiders in the background of that card if you look closely, which is kind of creepy, but I don't know. It's just, it seemed off from what happened in the movie, right? And then in Beast Hard-Headed, his left hand is definitely on something interesting, but we can't really tell what it is. Maybe there are going to be more cards that are going to be revealed that show it in a better view, but he's definitely holding on to something that is like an item. And I feel like we've been seeing this common theme that there are just like weird items that are involved. There's also in Aladdin Street Rat, there's this gold metal orb that we see in the background again. And then in Lilo Galactic Hero, the top right corner kind of looks like the Great Illuminary to me. So as far as set one goes, those are all of the things that stick out. Set two. So in the artwork for Grand Pabby, there are glowing symbols that are similar to what I feel like are on the papers and in the book that Arthur is looking at in his card artwork. Prince Charming is also holding some weird glowing triangular item that we haven't seen yet. So this is the first time. So maybe it's another puzzle piece in this whole ordeal. We just don't know what yet. In Rapunzel Gifted Artist, she does appear to be in the Great Illuminary. And then Merlin Shapeshifter. There is a trinket in the bottom left corner that appears to be the same shape as the Great Illuminary logo that is seen in like the main Lorcana logo, but obviously on a smaller scale. So, oh, it's a lot. There's a lot and there's going to be a lot more. There's going to be a lot more. And I don't even know, like I said, some of it is just, I don't know what it is, but this is interesting. This is interesting, you <laughs> <Yeah>. know? <laughs> I get you. I get yeah. you. Um, anything? I know that it's not normally your, your thing that you look at per se, but is there anything that you've noticed that I've missed or anything that you've noticed that you think, oh yeah, I, I think that is, I'm on the same page as you. No, I think you do a really good job just looking at the art and picking out specific details of it. So, yeah, I don't have anything extra. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're probably like, that was way too much. No, <laughs> I don't think so. No, definitely not. <laughs> okay. Um, but, yeah, I'm I'm interested to see what else is going to be revealed. Obviously, at this point in time that we're recording, not everything has been, but, I mean, they're on a... They're on a pretty tight time schedule here if they're going to want to release everything about a week before. So hopefully they're going to start to pump out more cards. I already feel like we've seen an increase in card reveals within the past several days alone. So hopefully they stay on that pace because it's exciting. Yeah, they're going to have to bump up the pace probably. <laughs> <laughs> it's not enough. I think Mushu Report had said at one point that they were going to have to do like five card reveals a day in order to stay on schedule and they haven't been doing that necessarily. So they really got to get going. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun the next couple weeks as uh, the cards come out. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so with that being said, I think that closes our episode. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. <laughs> um, next time we are going to be talking about the infamous concept of the beatdown. Dalton's gonna probably be running you mainly through that because of his history with TCGs and that concept. So until then, we are continuing to upload more episodes to our YouTube channel. Dalton's competed in a couple of online tournaments and so he's been posting his matches doing that. And we're going to continue with our starter deck giveaway. We actually reached our second tier this past weekend. So after we're done with this episode, we're going to pull our winner. So good luck to whoever you are. <laughs> and then once we hit a hundred followers, we'll give away the last starter deck that we have left. So go ahead and follow us on Twitch and then click on our discord link that is in the description of this episode to join our giveaway channel. Comment in there to add your ticket, basically your entry ticket. And we will pull the next winner whenever we hit 100. So until then, I hope you guys have a good rest of your week. And we'll catch you next time. Yeah, appreciate all your support. Have a wonderful day.